welcome to the Metal Voice. Today on the show, Alan, who do we got? Dennis Stratton himself. <laughs> Going to talk wow. about the new Lionheart album. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. The yeah. Grace of a Dragonfly, which was released last week on March 15th on Metalville Records. Correct, Dennis? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, when it came out over here, we're supposed to on the 22nd of February, but um, everyone that ordered it, they, they were still waiting for the, for the album to be delivered because it was, there was emails flying everywhere from Amazon, from everywhere saying it's been delayed, you can't get it here. So it's been coming out gradually throughout the last three or four weeks. So it's been a bit of a nightmare for us. So the good news is we're promoting it as it's being released. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Timing's impeccable. <laughs> Tell us about the themes. I see a lot of war themes happening on this album, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, the big vocals and grandiose vocals and a lot of war themes, you know, V is for victory and... Tell us yeah. about the themes on the album, if you don't mind. Well, um, after we did the uh, Reality of Miracles, that um, uh, we found during Reality of Miracles with lockdown that we were able to still record and, and uh, work uh, with the Lionheart being stuck at home. So basically, um, Lee started writing these lyrics. And, um, and then uh, when he came up with a couple of, of songs that... Uh, Steve was sort of like putting some tunes down to um, uh, the lyrics sort of like tended to lean towards uh, World War II. But Lee was, what Steve and Lee were saying was that um, uh, basically they were, he was writing the lyrics as a, uh, a thank you to um, all the uh, men and women that sacrificed their lives in the Second World War. So, yeah. that, you know, we, we could live a, 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 a sort of freer life. Um, it wasn't to elaborate war. It wasn't to sort of try and. It, it's basically it's an anti-war um, thing. This was all. This was all before Ukraine and uh, Gaza and all that. So well before that. So when we looked at some of the songs, the, the titles of the songs that Lee was coming up with, yes. It, so we all started writing in that sort of way that. Um, when some, luckily for us, some of the, the guys and girls that have reviewed the album, some journalists and uh, and people like yourselves or whatever, um, they've actually listened to the read the lyrics and listened to the lyrics and um, and have been saying that hey, it makes a, a lot of sense. So basically, it was it was not to elaborate anything to do with the war, but it was a way in, in saying thank you to all them people that, that sacrificed their lives. Um, it's like one of the songs I wrote on it with Little Ships. Uh, I didn't know Lee was going to call that Little Ships until it was just a tune come to my head with the harmony guitars um, and a melody that I was la 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 in. And, um, and then Lee, Lee uh, you know, uh, he said, I'm going to call these Little Ships about all the fishing boats that went to Dunkirk to rescue all the soldiers that were stuck there. So it, that's how it all got rocking and rolling. It was... Um, and then the songs, the lead just come up with so many fantastic lyrics uh, with the songs. And that's how we ended up um, putting like a concept album together. Didn't start off that way, uh, but after, after about three or four songs, we went, it, it's not such a bad thing. So let's let's do it as a thank you to all them people. So, well, we're very, very proud of it. You know, as, you, as if you listen to the lyrics and read the lyrics, you can see through the way he's written the, the words that, it is a lot of love that's gone into into the lyrics. That's so quite nice. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's a great sounding LP, very well produced. Let's get that out out front. Uh, uh, just to discuss maybe the thoughts process. I mean, this is pretty. You know, there are some songs that are a celebration, like "V for Victory," uh, yeah. but some of the songs have a darker ma matter, and you're kind of marrying them together with a kind of a positive, made, sometimes poppy sound. Well, can you want to just discuss a little bit about the the, the the fit between the the lyrics and the sound. Um, well, no, basically we, we've we've said this to many people that some some people in Japan started comparing us to to some different different bands. And me and Steve were doing the interview with Burnham. It's both of us said at the same time we write for Lionheart. We don't write to try and sound like a, uh, some another band, or we don't write songs. We don't record them 
to sound like someone else, um, it, it, we just write it for Lionheart. And because we have, um, it's a knack of working behind big harmony choruses, big anthem choruses, and the harmony guitars, and um, Lee just adds the icing on the cake by by, by writing all these lyrics. Um, it, he has a lot of um, memories, a lot of history uh, where he is. Uh, he collects a lot of things from from that sort of time, so it means a lot to him. So he was he was able to um, to sort of relate to them songs a lot more than us. Uh, Steve was working, you know, in the studio 10, 12, 15 hours a day, putting some of the stuff that we were sending to him through, like, at home, just messing about with different different calls, different tunes, um, different ideas for choruses and, and verses and middle eights. So it was it was quite nice to have Lee. It, it's like people misinterpret a lot of the things, like on, on Reality and Miracles, one of the songs, Thine is the Kingdom, we had people saying, oh, you've gone religious. Well, no, because <laughs> that, that song is about um, gangs in New York, um, different turf wars and, uh, you know, border, border lines and things like that. So that was completely off off, off, off judgment, the fact that uh, we're, we're writing a song, he's writing a song about the gangs in New York and people are saying it's about a religious sort of thing. So... No, you have to listen to the songs and read the lyrics to really understand the way Lee has written the songs uh, as a gesture for these people that served in the war. Um, it's hard for me to explain the finer details because a lot of the work went on between Lee and Steve because Steve sits in the studio. Me, me and Rocky, we just sit at home working and putting little tunes together. So Steve then puts all the puzzles all, all the pieces to the puzzle together, you know, the jigsaw goes together in the studio. So it's hard for me to really find uh, the fine matters of the songs, like the, you know, intricate little things, because, you know, I, I better put Steve or Lee on there can probably tell you a bit more. <laughs> Den Dennis, do you get a lot of people going, this this album sounds great, by the way. Big, big yeah. sound. Yeah. It really does. Do you get a lot of people saying, this is the former guitarist of Iron Maiden. Why is he doing music like this? Like, why is it, you know, is, it's more like Queen than it is Maiden, right? Do you get a lot yeah. of resentment? I wouldn't call it, maybe resentment is the wrong word, but you get a little surprise. Maybe surprise is a better way to say it. You get a lot of surprise from, let's say, Iron Maiden fans who follow you and saying, wait a second, this is not like Iron Maiden. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I get totally, to me. I totally understand that. But also, what some of these fans need to understand, same as people, you know, some of the old school will know. But the band I was, the band I was in before I made and Remus Down Boulevard, RDB, was a twin harmony guitar band that followed Wishbone Ash all over the world, uh, all over the country. Um, Capability Brown with all the harmony guitars, all the harmony vocals. Uh, on RDB, our old band, we, we had that between me and Dave singing and harmony guitars. So. Basically, when I went went into Iron Maiden, the, Steve and Dave used to come to the Bridge House in Canning's Town in West Ham, where I had a residency. We used to play there twice a week, and Dave and Steve used to come down and watch me play. That's why when they signed the deal in '79 to EMI, they offered me the job. I didn't go down for an audition. They sent me a telegram, uh, and I met them in the ship in Wardour Street, well known for the for the marquee, and. Um, Basically, they said, here are the Soundhouse tapes. We want you to, get, to let us know what you can do. And I went, great. So they offered me the job straight away. But my impression, my idea was to go home, listen to the Soundhouse tapes and listen to the, the songs that they had recorded or demoed already, which were very punky, very single guitar rhythm, single guitar solo, um, very punky, as I say, and very raw. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically I said to Steve, listen, I come from a harmony guitar band. I sat down with Dave and I said, Dave, are you, would you be into this? And he went, I'm open to any suggestions. And Dave was so easy to get on with. Um, Steve loved it. Uh, the first lot of songs we, we laid into, uh, I started putting the, the harmony guitar parts into, into some of the riffs. 
which they liked, um, started doing some harmony vocal with Paul in the rehearsal studio. And that's how it, the, the, the harmony guitar style got introduced to Iron Maiden. But remembering that all them songs from Metal for Mothers tour uh, in the 79 and 80s, the first two albums where people have to remember that apart from Killers, all them songs were written. So all I had to do was get the raw songs with with the very punky raw sound and make them bigger and, and, and make the production bigger by adding these harmony guitars and adding the harmony vocal, not to change the sound of Iron Maiden, but to make the songs more interesting. And that's what I did with like songs like Running Free, Phantom of the Opera, all the harmony little riffs that you hear were just little bits to polish the song up a bit more. So it wasn't to change change the sound of Iron Maiden, but I've always been a lover of AOR. You know, before with RDB, I was listening to Toto, Foreigner, Journey, uh, Kansas, so many different American bands. Also, White Snake, Wishbone Nash. They were loads of bands that had more harmony guitars and harmony vocals. Um, so basically, that's what I loved. And so after Maiden, me and Steve Mann and Rocky Newton and their favourite bands were the same bands that I loved. So it was natural to write the songs in that vein of a lead vocal and the part three part harmony uh, with the big anthem choruses. I, I, I'm um, going to I'm going I'm to add something here, Dennis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's fascinating because when there were nominations for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you were included because yeah. I think they understood that you were the sound of Maiden. Like somehow you create, helped, helped, sorry, helped create that sound of Maiden, that dual guitar sound, those harmonies. Yeah. I, I mean, well, I'm very proud of that, Jimmy, because they kept that, when, when the other guys went in, with Adrian and Yannick, when they carried on with that, with the harmony guitars, I was well pleased because it was something that, that I stood for and something that I introduced to the band. But if you follow my uh, love of that AOR kind of music, you can notice it by when Lionheart had a break around about 87, 88, in 90, 1990, I joined Prime Manus. So me, me, Tino and Rock, uh, me, Tino and Chris went to Japan, signed a deal in Japan for 15 years. If you listen to the Brian Mantis songs and the albums, you see the similar sort of feel to the AOR, lead vocalist, good production, but anthem choruses with three-part harmony. So it's been part of my life, not just with Maiden, but it's been part of my life before Maiden and also after for 40-odd years. Um, and I still love listening to all the big choruses and all the big uh, anthems of the three-part harmony, which a lot of bands are coming back to now and using them in the choruses. So I, I'm happy. Uh, I know a lot okay. of people, Maiden fans, as you say, would criticise it because it's not heavy metal. I don't know. Is, is, was White Snake ever heavy metal? Was Bad Company heavy metal? Right, was UFO exactly. heavy metal? You know, they're hard rock, you know, and they're, they're you know, with UFO, some of their songs sounded like, you know, pop songs, some of them in, in the early days. So we don't class that as heavy metal. But we do what we love with the vocals and the harmony guitars and the great vocal. That's why you need a good lead vocal to, to get above them three-part harmony choruses. But it's a lot easier to write songs for Lionheart or Prime Mantis when you're in that vein of style of music, you know, if, if it makes any sense, you know. Yeah, you know, we see a lot of bands like, you know, Kick Axe or even Rocky with Grand Slam now. Praying Mantis has a new album out. What, yeah. What's the plan? Lionheart's been around since the late 80s. What, what's your next step? What's the plan to, to for this album and, and touring and your future in Lionheart? What's what's the overall plan? Well, yeah, that, that's been the biggest, biggest problem for Lionheart ever since. And we started in 1980, not late 80s. But let's let's look at look at the lineup in the band. Everyone in the band has separate projects. And the problem that Lionheart had in the early days, when we came over to Los Angeles in 1984 with CBS, CBS Records, 
We recorded Hot Tonight in, in uh, Sound City Studios in Van Nuys. And fantastic experience. But when we come home, we were due to go on to REO Speedwagon because we had um, Kevin Beamish producing it from REO Speedwagon. We were supposed to go on tour with Kansas. Got let down everywhere across the board. Uh, the tours didn't happen. Uh, we were su- going to support. The tours never happened. So we came home and we had to start uh, working from scratch again. Getting We got supports on Def Leppard. All in the UK, Def Leppard, we went on support for um, uh, White Snake. Uh, we were doing gigs for ourselves. Um, but then as Lionheart carried on, never ever uh, as it made any kind of income. Uh, and so when we got back together to do Second Nature, which I think was around 2016 or 17, it still doesn't create an income. But what we have done, is by working on it for ourselves and, and representing ourselves, as you know, Steve Mann's in Michael Schenker, Rocky does a bit of work with Grand Slam, Clive is working with certain people, Lee is flat out with Sweet. I'm working all over Europe and going with Maiden United and all the uh, Iron Maiden conventions that I do all over Europe, Scandinavia, uh, as far as South Africa, uh, everywhere, uh, New Zealand. Um, so that's where our income comes from. So when it comes to Lionheart, that's always been a big problem because it doesn't create an income. So the problem we have, getting to your story, I know it's taken a long while, very sorry. <laughs> but, uh, the thing okay. is, it's you know, where, where do we earn any money from Lionheart? People download it, they stream it. You know, we, we're not a, a, a money working band, so we can't afford air flights, we can't afford a tour where we're going to hire a truck and hotels and whatever. So what we have to do with Lionheart is work in between the projects that everyone else has. Um, And as I said earlier, the uh, the magic of COVID, if there was anything good come out of COVID, um, was uh, the reality of miracles because that album would never have been finished uh, while Steve is still on tour with Michael. And um, while I'm all over the place and Lee's on tour with Sweet, you could never get the five of us in the same, what, at home at the same time. Or you could never get Steve, God bless him, in the studio in Hanover in Germany. You couldn't get him sitting down because he never had the time. If he didn't, if he didn't do one thing, he'd done something else and then he did something else. And then he was helping produce an album or he was producing an album himself. So to get in in that studio was priceless. And we found by COVID that he couldn't move. He had to stay <laughs> So he was basically... Shut him down. <laughs> he was nailed, nailed, they nailed him to the studio. Yeah. So he Dennis, was not allowed. <laughs> Dennis, have you had any... Like I see online, have you had any offers? Paul Diano is touring everywhere. Have you had any offers to sort of join him or maybe tour with him? Yeah. That's, yeah, you know... Yeah. Uh, I, I, Stephen Juris, last year, um, Stephen Juris, who's, who's sort of like basically looking after his affairs, um, he uh, he contacted me about 20 times. I, I even met him in Milan at the Maiden gig uh, for British Lions and Maiden. I had a long chat with him. But he contacted me last year. Um, and in 2020, I was due to go to Brazil to work with a, a band there called Blood Brothers and do the whole first album and some of the songs from the second album because basically I did a lot of, did all, most of the work on Killers, but I never got to record it. Um, so all the pre-production was done while we were doing uh, the Kiss tour and, and, and Judas Priest tour. So I was already, that was already in the set, some of them songs from Killers. Um, so yeah, so he contacts me uh, in 2020, I'm due to go to Brazil to do a, a month tour and it got called off because of COVID. March, April 2020. So when he contacted me in 23, when COVID had gone and when everyone was going back to work, uh, he contacted me. But unfortunately, he asked me, Dennis, outright, would you would you play, would you ever join Paul Diano on the stage? And I said, I'm never going to say never. I said, but at the moment, it's just the wrong time. I said, because I'm committed to the tour that I was booked in in 2020 
I'm now going in 2023. Uh, so I'm going in November, and the tour goes through November, December, and I come back to the UK in January. And he said, but I can offer you this, I can offer you that. I said, yes, I understand, but I am not a person that would turn my back on someone. I'm an honest person, and I will, I've committed to this tour, and these people, these people have worked very hard. So I said, so it's impossible for me to turn my back on them, uh, and I will honour their um, the arrangements. So yes, I couldn't, I couldn't do any work with Stephen Juris or Paul, um, and off I went, and we did the tour. It was fantastic. I came back at the beginning of January, um, and now I hear that he's um, he's starting the the, the role of him with, with the gigs. But in this new year, in 24, I have yet to speak to Stephen Duras about anything in the future. But I did say to him, I'll never say never, uh, because, you know, many years have passed now, so don't carry things on, silly little arguments, and move on. There's more things to worry about in this world than petty arguments. <laughs> so we move on. We've all grown up. So you're open um, to the. You're open to it. That's what you're saying. You're it, open anything it. could happen this year or even next year. Um, I've made them touring over in Brazil this year, so um, uh, I don't think there'll be many sort of like of us going over there because they will be touring extensively. Um, but as I say, I haven't heard from him this year. Uh, whether or not he'll come back with another offer, I don't know. But with Lionheart, we're we're hoping that. Um, if Stephen and Lee can get a break, you know, there's a festival they want us to do in October. Mm -hmm. And um, it's over here at Firefest. And we're, we're up for doing the festival. But as always with Lionheart, there's always a spanner chucked in the works, which is, there's always an obstacle, which is now um, the, the, the couple of weeks that we were going to rehearse from the last three or four albums, uh, and also songs from the new album that we've not played live. We've not played anything from uh, Reality and Miracles or um, The Grace of a Dragonfly. We've not played them together yet because we've just recorded them. Um, but as usual, there's always a problem. And Sweet now, Andy Scott, has booked a tour, uh, which Lee will be on, and it's quite a long tour that takes him right up to just before we're supposed to do this festival. So where Lee is going to find a time to rehearse, as I say, it's, it's you know, your family come first. So he needs to live and earn money. That's where his income is. You mm -hmm. can't stop him working, but where's he going to find a time to actually rehearse with the band? And there's always a problem like that with mine. You know, we'd love to be on a tour, you yeah. know. I mean, you got a fantastic sounding album. You got a great lyrics, uh, every musicianship, and it, it's just sad that this it might just sit on the shelves with with nothing backing it up. It's exactly. discouraging. You know, we did that with, as I said, so you know, we, we did that with uh, the Reality of Miracles. It was a great album. We never got the chance to progress anymore. Uh, and at that time, Michael Schenker was doing an extensive tour. He went, uh, he went everywhere. So Steve was never at home. So um, it made it even harder. And, you know, with, with Metalville helping us, but they do, you know, we're not being paid anything. You're still doing it for nothing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and I have to I have to work with my, I need an income. So it's one of them things that, you know, you do the work where you're going to get some money to come in to live. Um, and it's a shame because you don't get the back in now. Um, I remember doing interviews before the album came out. Bruce Dickinson said, and his own words, if you don't buy a band's albums, don't expect to see them play live. Because yeah. if you're going to yeah. download it or you're going to stream it for pound, one pound or 50p, how do you expect the band to get from London to Manchester and play live with no money? So it, yeah. it, it was his words that I repeated on many an interview. You know, <laughs> It goes without saying, where, where do we find the cash to, to, the, to help us? You know, It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Let me pick your brain on Bruce, okay? What yeah. do you think about his new album, like Magic Project? It, it, that's probably down more down your lane, right? Yeah, I've not actually heard it, funny enough. I'm oh, sorry. okay. <laughs> um, uh, I was hoping he would come. <laughs> and we were over in, uh, where were we? We were somewhere in Brazil, and I was, he was there promoting it. <laughs> I sent him a message saying, pop in. 
you know, we come and have a beer or something, you know. But uh, he's been very busy. But no, I, I mean, now it's all calmed down a bit back here now. I'm off on to a, a song with Maiden United, but um, I, I mean, I keep meaning to have a listen to the album, but I've heard, yes, a lot of Maiden fans are saying the same thing. It's not actually uh, that heavy. So be nice when you give it a listen, you know. What about Blaze, Blaze Bailey? Have you ever jammed with him on stage? No, met him? I, I've never met Blaze. Um, what? I saw him what? on TV. No, I've never met him. Um, wow. I saw him on TV. He was on a, he was on a, a TV program over here. And uh, I've never met him, and I've never spoke to him. Um, but I thought, what a polite guy. He was charming. He, uh, he went on this TV show. And I, I don't know, I can't remember what the TV show was. And, um, and I thought, what a lovely man. And uh, yes, I, I, I would love to meet him. I would love to get on the stage and play with him. But never had the opportunity. Our paths have never crossed. Um, so, yeah, that's another thing probably we should we should look at. Yeah. I think, I think <laughs> we need to write that down and take note and send a message to Blaze. We need a, a Stratton Blaze Bailey song, like a collaboration <laughs> of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been, have yeah, you been exactly. listening to his yeah, music exactly. over the years? Yeah. Have you li- have you been listening yeah, well, to Blaze's music? You know, we, we mentioned the um, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and uh, and I think they have some strange rules. I don't know. Uh, I don't know much about it. I was very very honoured to be uh, a nominee because uh, it goes a long way being nom- nominated for a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and. Um, when I found out that uh, the band uh, weren't really interested, um, yeah, a lot of people contacted me, ma- magazines and, and interviews and Zoom and radio and everything. You know, what's your feelings? I said, well, at the end of the day, the band had their reasons. Uh, I know Bruce made it quite public by saying that they were, whatever they were, the, the, the people that run it, um, he doesn't really like them. And uh, it was quite blatant that... Um, Bruce didn't want to have anything to do with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, after what he said, and um, and I said to everyone, "Listen, I have to, I, go, I have to honour what the band's feelings are, and if they're not interested, I have to go along with that decision." Um, you know, I had a chat with Steve Harris on the phone, and I told him that I, I would love to have gone, uh, and it's a big honour. But um, I, I when I looked into the rules. Um, it's something to do with being in the band so many years or something. That's why myself, Clive and Paul's name come up. But I felt a bit sad for Blaze because it was two albums he, he was worked on, isn't it, with Maiden? And, you know, he wrote, he contributed with the writing and he wasn't included. And I felt a little bit sad for him because he, he contrib- contributed quite a lot into Maiden while Bruce was on his travels. So why wasn't he included? But I think through the rules, it was because he hadn't been in the band for this year and he was not he wasn't included. I don't know the real five years. He was in the band five years. It's shocking. It's shocking. Really? Five years. Well, Two albums plus five. yeah, plus a few songs. Yeah, I didn't know so. it was five. But as I say, they're rules. So it's their bat and ball, they're their game. Um and if if Blaze didn't come in with that category of how many years ago, or whatever the rule is, he missed out. And um, I know Steve as well. I think he's a bit sad about it. But if the band, if the band decide we're not interested, I have to honour that and say, okay, uh, I, I grant. You know, I'm, I'm agreeing with your wishes, and uh, we'll we'll leave it. You know. Well, I'm happy you were included. I'm very happy that uh, you know. Yeah, there I must have been. That, that's you know. But yeah, I've got a little thing nominee. <laughs> you know, it's, all, I mean, it's not an award, and it's not. A, I'm not. A, I'm not being nominated, uh, but it was a nominee, which is good enough for me. You know, it's like the harmony yeah. guitars. It's good to have something that I put in that's still going on. So it's it's a nice feeling for me. You know. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy you're still working with the Maiden thing, people, fans. I, I guess the longer uh, I, I, they just keep getting bigger, right? Iron Maiden just keeps, and they get bigger, you get bigger. It just, it's just, it goes it's hand in hand, right? Yeah. And I, I must admit, I do enjoy it. I go to, I see Steve quite a lot. 
not only with music, but with West Ham and, you know, we talk about football on the phone and whatever. But the nice thing about it now is when he comes over with British Lions, it's easy to meet him, meet up with him easier because it's small venues. Um, and uh, he knows I do a lot of work for charity. Um, and Steve's helped me uh, with some charity stuff. Um, I drove up to Manchester to see him um, uh, with a British Lions gig. And he, we took a West Ham guitar up there at, a Red Strat and a West Ham guitar, PRS, and he signed it all. Uh, he gave me some of his wristbands for the charity. And, you know, it, it, it helps because if you can use them very famous people in the music business as uh, their signatures, it increases the, uh, the, the price of the tickets for the guitar order. It, the auction goes up a couple of grand because it's got his name on it as well as mine and a couple of other signatures. So it does help me in that, in that kind of way. And it's great to go and see him at the, like the O2 in London. Um, last couple of years, I've been all over to see him. Vegas, uh, Boston. Uh, yeah, it's been fantastic. So, um, uh, yeah, long way they carry on. You know, now, now they're carrying on with that other, that other tour following up. It'd be fantastic. I, I got one more question for you. I don't know if Alan has one more. I want to cut him off. Go ahead, Alan. If you... No, go ahead. I was going to ask. What song on Killers do you find you should have got more credit for that you really gave your you know you 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 really helped with the arrangements? Well, a very important question because most of the songs on Killers were already written, or all of them except Killers were already written before the first album. So basically, if you remember going back to seventy nine and ninety, early nineteen eighty. When we were doing the Metal for Mothers tour, well, a lot of people don't realise that they, 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 it's a, if you're headlining a show, which you know, if you're headlining, you need an hour and a half. If you're supporting, 45 minutes. So when we first got the band together with me taking Clive into the studio to introduce him to, to the lads and him getting the gig, uh, the idea was we were rehearsing both albums because we needed a one and a half hour set for Metal for Mothers. So all them songs were already written and put down as demos. I just added my harmony guitar bits and everything else. And then it was a case of Steve choosing what songs are going on the first album. And then when we got halfway through the Metal for Mothers tour, doing an hour and a half, um, they went, right, you're coming off that tour. You're now going on the Judas Priest tour where you're going to do a 45 minute slot. So then we reverted back to the first album and maybe Rothschild, one or two songs from the, from the Killers. But there was no chance to, you couldn't change anything on them songs. All I could do was add, add bits to them uh, yeah. to make them. So that was what we were doing. We get the first album done, that, then we played the 45, same set, 45 minute set to Kiss. Then once we went back and finished off the Metal for Mothers tour, it was an hour and a half. So we brought Killer's album back in. But as I say, we, we worked on Killer's. Steve wasn't a lover of that riff that we did. He didn't really like that much. But I think everything was so rushed that um, uh, everything had to be done yesterday for the record company, <laughs> whatever. And um, I didn't like women in uniform. I must admit, I've told a lot of people <laughs> I don't think we should have done a cover. Uh, they had so many good songs of their own. But I think that was down to uh, uh, Zomba music uh, for, for suggesting um, yeah. women in uniform. Uh, but as I say, the most ex the one I did the most work on was, was Killers because we were working on that um, right, right up until I departed from the band. Um, but as I say, the songs on the Killers album we're already being played live when we had to extend the set for an hour and a half. You know what I mean? The, the lyrics for Killers, Paul, uh, I think it was at the Live at the Rainbow, right? Where he sort of, he had a different set of lyrics. He went, Actually, you know. weren't there. You weren't there. You were on that one, right? On the I remember. Um, when we come back from the Kiss tour, uh, we did Women in Uniform at the Rainbow Theater, and then that was it. I was gone. Um, okay, so that's why, yeah. I'm not sure. We did do a gig at the Rainbow, but we headlined it. But I don't know if if uh, Killers was on there. But someone else told me that. Someone else pointed it out. The, the looks were changed. Stuff. They were alternate. Yeah, They're I think some, Steve may have done a rewrite somewhere and uh, 
we, 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 we have an, Dennis, we have an interview with Ace Freely tomorrow. You were on the uh, KISS tour. What were yeah. your memories with Ace Freely that you kind oh, of like- Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't, Rod won't mind me saying this, Rod Smallwood, but he didn't really want us mixing with uh, the, the big guys. Uh, we were still young. We just basically just formed as a band. We'd only been together nine months a year. Um, but I'm one of these people that I just go out and meet people. I have a lot of respect for support bands. And I have a lot of respect for the main bands if I'm supporting, um, because I never, I never really, I always try and get on with everyone. And uh, I must admit, Ace was very quiet, very quiet. I got on really well with um, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley to the point where um, they took me and Dave Lights out in Stockholm on the 9th of October, uh, nineteen eighty, for my birthday. So they wow. took us to a restaurant and. Uh, uh, Paul gave me a fire hat with all the signatures of the band on it. And uh, Eric was really good. But you never really saw Ace was very quiet. I only used to see him when he used to be walking onto the stage. And I've got photos taken with him. On my, I haven't got them on my phone. But I have lots of photos taken with, with Ace and, the, you know, Eric. I, I, um, I saw Ace uh, was on tour of doing some stuff over here a few weeks ago. Uh, and um, I never got to see him, and um, I, I was away as well. Um, but yeah, it's great to see him sort of like back and if he's playing. Um, but he was very, very quiet. But um, yeah, shocking, I, I, shocking you saying he's very quiet. I thought he'd be a little more louder or you know, more energetic. No, no, but I, he, as I say, he, I mean, he was very quiet in them day. He seems to, I never really spoke to him that much. Um, I really spoke to Paul and Gene more than anything, but um. Yeah, I never really got to really see him that much. But I used to see him as they were going on stage, and I'd always wave and he'd give it that. But he was always very quiet. So I'd love to meet him again because uh, he probably forgot about me. But, um, you know, it's <laughs> nice, to, nice to have their memories, you know. And also the photographs that I've got hung in. It's brilliant. Well, well I'll just wrap, that, up, wrap up the yeah. interview. You, yeah. I'll wrap up the interview using the last song on the album, Remembrance, Praying for World Peace. Nice little song. Is that was that written before or after the album was completed and, and after COVID and, and everything we've seen in the world happening today? What the last song? Yeah, remembrance, uh, praying for world peace. Oh, no, that, that was like, everything on that album was written well before Ukraine and Russia. Um, and um, I think uh, as as uh, Steve wrote on the uh, sleeve notes that. Um, People, it says it's a big point that people that start these wars don't have to fight them. They just sit behind a desk, and that is the big worry about everything. So um, it was just a coincidence that when the Ukraine and, and Russia war started, that this this album was always up, nearly, nearly nearly finished or basically at you know halfway through. And so it was the songs were already written before any of this happened. So. Uh, yeah, it, it, you know, it would be nice to be able to think about that. But, um, yeah, that's a great choice. Thank you. I'm glad you like the album. Grace of a Butterfly. A dra- butterfly. <laughs> the Grace of a Dragonfly. <laughs> it's out now. Pick it up. Not Butterfly, you know Dragonfly. The, you know, you know um, why the Dragonfly is? Because we found out that um, the Dragonfly was a nickname of the Spitfire plane that went up and did all the dog fights. So that's why the album cover has the has the dragonfly, and you can see the Spitfire through the, the uh, uh, transparent of the of the uh, dragonfly. You can see the Spitfire underneath. And that's that was yeah. it was a, yeah. it was a pleasure having you on, Dennis. Awesome. Thank yeah. you so much for the Congrats chat. Congrats to you and all the lads. Uh, you've done a fantastic job on this album, that's for sure. Well, I'll tell the boys. I'll tell them tomorrow when I, when I speak to them. But thank you so much. And thanks for your patience for um, yeah, finally no problem. picking up. <laughs> and it's the funny thing is, Nathan's out of the office all day today, so I couldn't do anything. So, But no, thank you both very much. <laughs>